one. Hi, my name is Tom Carney Jr. And I'm Janet Carney O'Brien, <laughs> Janet Carney O'Brien. And we're here to talk a bit about my father, Thomas Carney Sr. and his role in pharmaceuticals, particularly with respect to vaccines and the polio vaccine. Great, Tom, Janet, thank you both so much for taking the time to share a little bit of your father's story with us. From what I know of him, what you both have already shared, he was a really extraordinary and interesting individual who was key in so many medical advances and pharmaceutical advances throughout 1940s all the way through the 70s. And so I'm really looking forward to learning more about him. So I'm gonna go ahead and dive right in and just ask you to tell us a little bit about your dad's background. Who was Dr. Thomas Carney? Well, since we don't have all day, we'll try to be brief. But <laughs> number, one, number one is the caveat that we're dealing with the fuzzy memory concept. And we're talking about things that were 40 and 50 and 60 years ago. So, you know, there may be some fuzz, but we'll, we'll try our best. Um, dad was the, uh, the son of Irish immigrants. His father was the sixth of, well, the sixth of six children who came to uh, America from County Donegal, Ireland in about 1880. Um, his grandfather uh, worked on, they moved to West Central Pennsylvania. Grandfather, uh, his, his grandfather, dad's grandfather, father and two uncles, the three sons all worked on the railroad, the Buffalo, the Rochester, Buffalo, Rochester and Pacific Railroad. Uh, the family was the two, the two, the, th the three sons and three daughters. Um, the, my grandfather was the sixth, as I said, he was the only one to have married. The other five all lived together, the two bachelor uncles and the three uh, maiden aunts. Um, dad was, uh, as I said, the, the, he's the first the eldest of the four children of James, uh, living in Dubois, Pennsylvania. Dubois was a town that was originally a lumber camp, became a mining center and then a railroad center. Uh, all the males in the family worked on the railroad uh, prior to dad. Dad was working uh, at, a, uh, at a shoe warehouse, uh, really not a whole lot of career opportunity there. Uh, he was uh, a good student, obviously. He was also highly athletic. Uh, he, uh, he had he, in, in St. Catherine's High School in Dubois, there were like 15 boys in the entire school. Uh, he was a starter on the basketball team. And the last two years, his junior and senior year, St. Catherine's was the Pennsylvania State Catholic High School basketball champions uh, with 15 boys in the school. So they did pretty well. He also tells us, uh, I haven't seen him, but he told us he had a, a, a contract to pitch for, a, for at least a tryout for, as a pitcher for the Pittsburgh Pirates. He saw that always as his fallback position. In any event, he, he wasn't really sure what he was going to do as he graduated high school. He was probably the first high school graduate in the family. He thinks his mother, he thought his mother was the first high school graduate, but I've done some research and it doesn't look like she did graduate high school. So dad was probably the first high school graduate in the family. And just to jump in, his father had a third grade education. His father never went past third grade. Um, At best. So it was an opportunity for him. Yeah. No. Um, so he didn't really know what he wanted to do until his, the, the, the eldest of the, the aunts, Aunt Mary, who was pretty much a dominant figure in the family. Uh, she was the seamstress. She told him uh, that she had saved money and that he was going to go to college. And being an Irish Catholic immigrant family, the college was Notre Dame, of course. Mm -hmm. And Aunt Mary being Aunt Mary, what she said was. So he went to college. He used the rail passes that, that he got from the family and that's 300 and the number varies depending on when dad's telling the story. But uh, as I recall, it was $349, $350 pinned to the inside of his vest, 349 for room board and tuition and a dollar for fun. Um, <laughs> so uh, he set off uh, on the train from Dubois, Pennsylvania uh, to South Bend, Indiana. Probably not the first college the uh, first person from his high school to go college, but he thinks pretty much the first person from Dubois to leave state for college, yeah, to, right. to, leave, to leave the state of Pennsylvania for college. 
and he hadn't, you know, he had no idea what a co what college was or what a you know curriculum was or what a you know class syllabus was. He had he just arrived on campus with his money and went and paid his paid his tuition and then got the brochure to look and see what what he gets for his money, and that was that was the deal. He really wasn't um, intending to go be a a great scientist. He had no idea what he was going to be. He just knew he was going to go to college. So he went through the, the manual of classes and he knew he liked science. So he thought maybe he'd do chemistry. Uh, but then he realized that he could, um, with a few more classes to really load up classes, he could actually get a chemistry major and a chemical engineering major. So two for the price of one. And that was actually- For the same I, tuition. Yeah, it didn't tuition. cost me more, he could get two majors. So his decision, his career path was way more pragmatic. It was just, oh, it's a park. And so that's really why he started off as a chemical engineer and chemistry major. That's where he went. He just couldn't resist a park. And, you know, he, was, he did his, he, that's what he did. And he did mine hard work. So he went ahead and that's, that's how he graduated from Notre Dame with his chemical engineer major. And then um, from there, he went to Riley Tarr and Chemical in Indianapolis. He went uh, back to Indianapolis, or I went to Indianapolis, I'm sorry, to Riley Tarr and Chemical, which was a company that did, um, you know, they did make cam compounds basically out of oil products that was mm -hmm. coatings for railroad ties and light poles and things like that. And they also developed a compound for making rubber tires more durable. Um, uh, and he was there, I think a year, and then he went back to get his PhD, something like that. I think it was about yeah. a year or so, a year and a half. He went back to Penn State to get his uh, PhD in uh, organic chemistry and finished that. Went back to Riley to finish. I think it was they must have had something to do with his PhD. They had an obligation to come back to them. But then in 1942, got the opportunity to have a fellowship at University of Wisconsin. Um, and that was the year, it was obviously the year after we just entered the war. And the fellowship was motivated by the um, uh, 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 Surgeon General had put out an alert to pharmaceutical companies and researchers saying they really needed someone to develop a topical anesthetic because there were so many injured soldiers or victims of the war and they really wanted to, to do, find something to help them. So that really was the focus of his research at, at uh, University of Wisconsin for his fellowship. And he did, they did develop a product called Surficane, which was widely distributed commercially. I mean, it was used for the war effort, but then became a very popular commercial product. And he had said there was nothing more satisfying than seeing something that he had worked on relieve so much suffering. And that was when he decided that he went from, you know, the tar and chemical to medical research. He said, that's, that's, where, that's where his heart was. That's where he was going to go. So he came back from that fellowship um, I think he might have worked for Riley another year, perhaps. Year, but then went to he then got a job with Eli Lilly Pharmaceuticals in Indianapolis, and that's where he spent the next twenty years with Lilly. And then um, in 1964, he took the job with G.D. Searle in Skokie, which is when we moved to Lake Forest. So his next step was G.D. Searle, and that's sort of the beginning of our time in Lake Forest. And it, just to add that he started at Lilly as a bench chemist. And over the years, he rose. He was first director of research. And then they added development to the, he's now then director of research and development and then control. And he, he became uh, finally vice president uh, for research development and control, which is basically the guts of the pharmaceutical industry. Take a product from bench chemist research to control, getting it onto the market. Um, that was his responsibility for about the last eight years that he was there. That's, that's amazing. Having the dollar in his pocket on the train for, for fun and just snowballing into. And, and knowing incredible... dad, he probably, he probably had it at the end of the year too. I mean, he just, <laughs> <laughs> it was, he saw it as an investment. So he, just kept he, he sounds like a very pragmatic individual. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. So you said that he, you know, he talked about how proud he was of working with this, with, with the topical treatments coming out of the war. Did he share a lot with you about what being a researcher was like during that time period? That was kind of funny. Um, <laughs> uh, or funny in two ways, but one, he didn't, he didn't talk about his work a lot. What he did was he shared his passion for research generally, for learning stuff. Yeah, doing experience stuff. of research right dad, yeah. dad was dad was hands-on he didn't talk much about that kind of stuff occasionally there would be you no know, when we talk about cutter well some of we had direct involvement in some things but 
in terms of bringing his work home, there really wasn't that. He, I can read Punk, he would come home mostly a little bit later as, as after that, but he would come home and he would sit down in the living room with mom and before dinner and he would have a martini and they would discuss things and then we'd have dinner and we'd discuss whatever was going on in the world or in our classes or what, but he didn't say, you know, this, that, or the other thing is what, what I am doing. Uh, but, you know, we, we would periodically get stories of the things that excited him, the things that he was, he was very much interested in. So, so it was, as I said, it wasn't like he would come home and say. And he kind of talked more about it later in life when he reflected. Yeah. I think yeah, it's more very reflective reflections later. that came out. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. talking about the, the feeling, the smell of a lab, the <laughs> burner, the things that, how they'd hear a whoosh and everyone knew what that meant, that something was blowing up and they'd run and grab their fire extinguishers and run towards the whoosh. <laughs> He'd love, it was, it was like a personal experience of all the, all the senses involved. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that, that really, that really, he loved that part of it. He really yeah. did, that was the interesting thing. Very different today because they, things are so sanitary now. And uh, he, he, kind of be, he kind of bemoaned the fact that it's so much safer now. <laughs> Less, less blowing up, a little less <laughs> blowing up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, with, with all of these memories, I, clearly he was involved with a lot of different project, projects, but what are some of the products that, um, you know, people might be most familiar with that he had a hand <laughs> in develop? Yeah, I was thinking about that too, because he's, you know, I, I kind of actually had to refer to his memoirs for that. Um, because really during the 40s, a lot of the products, a lot of the research was was involved in the war effort. I mean, so many, so much of that research came out of, uh, helping wounded soldiers, sure. really. So those are the anesthetics. Those were the, um, uh, an, you know, anesthesias, anesthetics, but barbiturates, you know, they got very involved in painkilling uh, medicines back then. So this is when, during his early years when he was really very involved in that. Uh, but then that kind of segued if, with Lily, it was sort of running the gamut. They, he got into chemotherapy drugs, um, Methadone. Synthetic, synthetic penicillin. You, Penicil you right. Make, penicillin. You didn't have to grow penicillin. cultures anymore. You had you could make it out of chemicals. Right. So they could. So a lot of their work really was taking what was there and and making it better and making it mass producible, commercializing it. So there was things that that he he always talked about how what he got to do is take the cumulative effect of prior knowledge and they got <laughs> to and, and perfect it, make it even better. You know. So that's. Uh, I know. I think they did do methadone, right, at Lily? So that was sort of a yeah. So yeah, in the in the effort of trying to find something, pain relief was a, a lot of their focus. But chemotherapy, um, oral contraceptives. They were they didn't develop the birth control pill, but they were able to commercialize and refine it. So that was sort of a big part of their work at Eli Lilly as well. Um, but he did say. I mean, I, I I know that when he talked about the thing that really he loved the most really was or but that inspired him the most was the work on the, the polio or i'm sorry yeah the polio vaccine the salt the, vaccine how they the other, that. The one that janet did not mention is the antihistamines the pyranols uh, the problem, oh, with, yeah. that, the problem yeah. with that and this gets into the hands-on and the whole thing but the pyranol the antihistamines of the day were obviously sleep inducing so well yeah that brings up stories where they he would say yeah. they never developed something they didn't take themselves the scientists right the researchers in those days, if they're gonna develop a, a compound that they're gonna to give to somebody, they experimented on themselves first. They were the original uh, in, test cases. In fact, the, the pyranol <laughs> test, however, was my mother. Yeah. Was very, yeah. very susceptible to antihistamine. Yes. <laughs> and he, yeah. would, he brought this little green and yellow capsule home and asked her to take it before dinner one day. And she took it and halfway through dinner, she went to sleep and they decided they hadn't refined it yet. It needed to have but, some sort of stimulant but, included. So. so they added some stimulant to keep it from going to sleep when you took the histamine. Uh, and it worked and it became copyrinol, which was one for a long time, one of the major non-drowsy antihistamines. But yeah. he, he ascribes my mother to that one because she didn't fall, she, uh, eventually she did not fall asleep. <laughs> but yeah, they, they would, they, his, so you can't be a research chemist in pharmaceuticals if you're not willing to take what you're developing. So and I was going to like, you know, anyway, okay. back to the the polio thing. The reason that the reason Lily became so prominent in that was, of course, they didn't develop the salt vaccine. So I'll get credit for that. But they found a way. Dad, before the salt vaccine was even approved, he had an instinct that there was a way to take tissue culture, create tissue culture in test tubes, 
And I think it was the National Institute of Health had the only lab that did that. Well, then Lily, he convinced Lily to invest in their own lab for that. He just thought there was going to be a reason for it, didn't know what that yeah. was, but they didn't need to use animals anymore. They could actually culture tissue in test tubes and then they could grow whatever on those tissues. And then when the salt vaccine, which was based on my polio virus that you had to kill, they could, they were already ready to mass produce. They were already had all the foundation for just taking that to town and mass producing the that polio itself that then could be killed and turned into vaccines. So that's really how Lily became prominent in the salt vaccine. Right. And I know- but For most know of that period of time, Lily was producing more than 60% of all the salt vaccine that was being produced. There were other companies, but Lily had the, the lion's share of the production because they had the capability. Right. I did not know that they had that percentage. That's really, that's really mm -hmm. incredible and a, and a big responsibility. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But so Janet, I know you said that you were quite young when, you know, the polio vaccines first started being <laughs> distributed and, and Tom, you were a little bit older, but do you have any personal memories from that time period? I mean, it's interesting nowadays we're going through another pandemic and for many people, you know, um, in, in, in your age demographic, age demographic of, of a lot of people, this is, you know, they look back at polio a sort mm -hmm. of a comparison living through two time periods like this. Do you have any personal yeah. memories from that time period? I suspect Janet doesn't because she would have been. I was, I was a baby. Zero. It was 1955. <laughs> okay. um, I, I have some, but I, I, my, my memory is probably couched because in 1952, which was I guess the second or third surge of the polio epidemic, uh, I would have been about seven uh, and I contracted scarlet fever that summer. Um, so the combination of me having scarlet fever and polio being back, uh, I was managed to spend the entire summer in bed, which was not a lot of fun for a seven-year-old. So I have kind of a focused memory on that year. So I have some memory of what was going on there. I did not know anybody who uh, suffered contracted polio. Um, I don't remember that there was a lot of mass hysteria, a lot of paranoia. There was certainly unease, uh, particularly amongst parents. Yeah, um, sure. And because, in part because with most childhood diseases at that time, and polio was a childhood disease, it was a serious one, childhood disease, didn't quite know where it came from, didn't quite know how it was transmitted, didn't quite know what to do about it. Mm -hmm. uh, so when this polio thing, kid, kids kept getting paralyzed and some of them dying, um, yeah, there was unease about being out and about, particularly swimming pools were seemed to be a focus of concern. I don't know if that was actually justified, but but I can remember concern about swimming pools. I can remember concern about allowing me out because of my compromise system anyway. Uh, but I, as I said, no, no, not a lot of hysteria. But I, uh... Yep, we got a frozen again. Oh, frozen, we'll, we'll give it a second, it comes back. <laughs> yep. Sorry, Tom. I can probably continue on with that a little bit until time. Sure, yeah, reads. thanks, but, Janet. You know, like I said, I I was too young to remember anything. So that was, um, it's only from my own reading and documentations of, you know, that time. Um, I don't, I, I know in high school, I did have, I did know someone who had had polio. I, I've known actually adults that have had polio and were compromised people might from my generation. So I, certainly it was real. Um, at the time I was not able to, I was just too little. <laughs> I just right. rolled with it. You sort of see some of the some of the later repercussions, hear the stories later on from from the time period. And that's actually right. a good segue into, you know, Tom mentioned earlier the cutter incident, which was, yeah. you know, yeah. a sort of a, a cautionary cautionary tale of what happens when you don't take the proper precautions with preparing and distributing vaccines. Right. So well, I can yeah, I can carry you through that a little bit too, because that was um, and at first it, so in so in fifty-five. When it when Lily's first started distributing the vaccine, and then, as I said, Dad was that was sort of his his most proud achievement as being such a, a part of that whole whole process and whole rollout. Um, but a Tom, this would be a story of, of Tom's as well. I hate to tell, hate to take steal his thunder, but he was in the car with Dad, and I, he he recalls very clearly the Marion Boulevard Street that was near our house. And on the radio came the news that children who were, so they had started the vaccination process. Kids, parents were lining the kids up in schools. I mean, there was just mass, mass vaccination going on. And all of a sudden kids who had been vaccinated started coming down with polio. 
and uh, it, 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 you know, it was a startling panic. All of a sudden, ensued. they stopped the back, you know, every, everything kind of came to a screeching standstill. But Dad, Tom remembers being in the car with Dad, Dad doing a U turn, just driving home, dropping him off at the house, and heading to the lab to see what was going on, what had happened. And I guess they pretty quickly identified that the, uh, the batches that were actually infecting children came from one laboratory in California. So Lily had a huge manufacturing product, but there was a lot of smaller labs that were doing the same thing. And the problem was that, um, so Salk had his own protocol for how to kill, you, you start with the live polio virus, but then you use formaldehyde and you know, some, some protocol, very stringent protocol to kill that virus. And then that goes into the vaccine and causes the immune response. But I guess the federal government um, really didn't have, didn't hold that type of level of uh, protocol. They basically had a much looser guideline. So I originally, I thought that Cutter had cut corners, but actually what they had done is they just followed the federal guidelines at the time. And it left the door open to this type of error, which is what happened. And, um, oh, I forgot, so, you know, hundreds of children were infected, 10 died, many, many, many paralyzed. And you would have thought that that would have been the end of the whole, whole vaccination. That's what dad's worry was. Right. But as soon as they identified where it came from and how it happened, it, I mean, to me, it's astonishing that they were re-able re to regain national trust in, uh, from then on, all the labs had to then you know, follow the SALK protocol. And they reintroduced the vaccine rollout again. Um, and it was, they, they, they did halt it for several months. And then there was a competing vaccine, Sabin. And that was the oral polio vaccine. I think probably a lot of people in my generation might remember. The sugar cube one? The sugar cube. Yeah, that was, the, that was the saving. So they know that a lot of people are a little more likely to take the oral, oral vaccine because it just seems safer. The, the SALK still had a little bit of a tinge of worry. So they brought back, they brought it back around with Sabin and they continued the vaccine effort and everything went fine. We're back to the SALK vaccine now because we've had a generation that no longer feels that discomfort with the vaccination. So I know that my kids got the regular salt vaccine, not the sugar cube. Um, Tom, I'm sorry, I, I think I stole your thunder with the... the That's okay, because I've been gone. I just lost my internet access and I had to oh, come... Dear. Oh dear. Oh, that's what it was. Yeah. Oh, oh, that's what was going in and out. So, so I'm back here. So I just I just went through sort of this. I, I, I mean, your story about being in the car with dad, I know that you're going to tell that, that dad <laughs> turning around him. But we both, Tom and I were talking before this meeting and just we were both kind of marveling <laughs> that had something like that happened today with our current vaccine, what would, what, what would it be like? I mean, so the fact that there was trust regained in the process to me was astonishing, you know? I, I think that the fact that it's difficult to get widespread acceptance of wearing a mask suggests what would happen yeah. if, <laughs> right. if, yeah. if we had a, a cutter-like incident in a vaccine. Um, it was, I mean, father knows best concept. I mean, it was the 1950s that things, we were coming out of a war. It was, you know, the government was actually there to help people and it seemed to help a lot of people. You, know, you don't need to get to the other stuff. But yeah, I mean, things worked. And so if, uh, if it seemed like a good thing to do, then there was generally a tendency to accept it. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Can you, Tom, just tell us really briefly about what it was like being in the car with your dad when he heard that story, when he heard what was yeah, going on? This is in part the fuzzy memory I talked about before. Because, <laughs> uh, I do have a vivid memory of it. I was, it was, uh, nine, I would have been 10 ish. Uh, and we were going someplace. I don't remember exactly where, but dad was driving and we were driving down a, a, a four lane road. Now I have a specific memory of, the, of, of Meridian Street in Indianapolis as being that road. And as a matter of fact, it could not have been the, the road I remember because we wouldn't have been on that road in that year. It would have been the next year. But anyway, I do remember in the car that we were listening to the news and the news broke of, of there were kids getting sick. There were kids getting paralyzed. There were kids dying, apparently from the polio vaccine. And dad 
Dad was very reserved. He didn't swear. He didn't say mm. anything. He just made a big sweeping new turn in the middle of the highway to go back home. Uh, now he described that he says, Janet's sister, my, my elder sister, who is, he says she was in the car, which is not like her because she was only three. He said going to a music lesson. She was only three. <laughs> she wasn't so she a prodigy, let's just lesson. say. She's very I have checked with her and she has no <laughs> recollection of that. So it was me in the car, but dad would have been concerned not so much about who was in the car with him, but the potential catastrophic effect on the acceptance of the polio vaccine. If, yeah. this, if this seemed to be a problem with the vaccine, then all this default acceptance would have been washed away really very quickly. Yeah. Uh, so he, we drove back. He didn't say a word. He just dropped me off and they went back to the lab and we didn't see him for a couple of days yeah. while they huh. tried to figure out what happened. And it turned out that um, John, did you go into this at all about? The, I did go into the, the cutter that they, that they followed. They were not following this, uh, the SALT protocol, but they weren't necessarily. I mean, they, they actually were sued and they, the cutter was not won the suit. They, they, they were found not liable because yeah. they actually did follow the guidelines of the day, which were very loose. They yeah, did. One, one of the problems <laughs> was that they, the NIH did have some preliminary data that suggested there was a problem in the cutter protocol. Uh, but it got lost someplace in the chain of command and nobody ever told anybody. As a result, the head of NIH and the secretary of HEW both lost their jobs. They got fired. So there uh, was repercussions. There was, there was that, there was that yeah. repercussion, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but true. you know, they, they figured out that it was the protocol, that it wasn't the problem with the salt vaccine. There was the there were the couple of batches. They they clamped down on the review on, on inspections and all. And and then then Saban came along, so it wasn't a problem. Right. It did not affect the acceptance of uh, vaccines as a widespread cause problem for a short period of time because nobody knew what it was. But once they figured out what it was, which is this one lab, there were five labs that were producing it. Lily had the lion's share, but there were some other labs that were producing it. It was just this one lab, just some batches, and they got that cleared up and seemed to be okay. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's <laughs> very dramatic story. <laughs> but and but I mean, from everything from the actual, you know, bad batch of vaccines to the dramatic U-turn. I mean, the whole mm -hmm. the whole thing. Um, well, in the interest of time, I just want to wrap up really quickly by yeah. asking you. I mean, obviously, from the the span of time that your father was working and everything that he was involved with he probably had a, a lot of interesting, you know, retrospective viewpoints over, over his career. So you shared a little bit about, you know, that he wrote a memoir. What was his, what was his motivation, do you think, for doing so? I, I think he had a couple of things. One is that he, as we've discussed, well, Rob, he, he was well aware of the significance of the time in which he was doing significant work. He, he knew what his role was and he knew, uh, not only the excitement, but the drama and, and just all of the history of, of this stuff. He worked with some great people. Uh, and one of the people he worked with was a, a researcher, that, um, George Close, who was a preeminent cancer researcher, predating that. He was older than that. So he was well in the, in the pantheon of cancer researchers. And they worked in the cancer research, in the cancer drugs at Lilly. Dad worked with very closely with, with Dr. Close. And he tells that he kept trying to get Dr. Close to write down what he had done for, so people would know the excitement of research and all. And it was one of his great regrets that he never convinced Close to do that and Close died before he wrote anything down. Um, that also in the mid eighties had his own little cancer scare. And I think maybe there was this intimation of mortality concept that he had been trying to get closed to write down. So he decided that perhaps he ought to write down, at least for his family, um, because some of the stuff that he wrote down about other people clearly did not intend to have published generally. I mean, he was pretty straightforward about some people, but he did not suffer badly. But he just wanted his family to know what the times were like, what pharmaceuticals were like, what the glories 
the glory years were like because he was truly excited about what he did. He he loved. He loved it, and he he always talked it off to luck. That he was the luckiest man in the world. Yeah. He'd been there or earlier. There would have been not the resources available to do what he did. Mm-hmm. And if he'd come along later, most of this would have been done already. So he came in that window where he was able to do what nobody else had done in the pharmaceutical industry because this is just where and we And he was came. also very aware that he was part of a chain of knowledge that continues on. He really understands that every scientific achievement is a piece of that chain. And mm-hmm. he, he just wanted to record his segment yeah. and maybe future generations can see that segment and see where that leads them now into what we have today. It's always, it's an accumulation of knowledge and he just wanted to make sure that that was somehow written down. That's sure. Yeah. He, 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 was sure giving, he was given a window of opportunity, but then really took it and, and made he, the he most of it, it. Yeah. for himself yeah. and for, and for so many others. Yeah. yeah. Well, Janet, Tom, thank you both so much for talking about your father with us. This was so fascinating. And um, as you can see, we hate, we hate to talk about it. I, yes, I could very (laughs) reticent. It's like pulling teeth. (laughs) Thank thank you guys so much. And um, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Hope it helps. Absolutely. Bye everyone. All right. Bye-bye. Bye now.